Good evening, everyone. Hope you're all right tonight. So, uh, let's open here to 1 Kings chapter 18. We have another word of prayer, and I have a few slides I want to go through with you. Kind of give you the lay of the land, see the geography, see what the area looks like that we're going to be reading about tonight in 1 Kings chapter 18. All right, so let's pray. Lord, as we look at this very rich and challenging chapter, we just pray for your presence tonight. We ask for your spirit to be in our midst and to speak to us out of your word. Uh, we thank you for great people of faith of the past, Lord, and may it inspire us and challenge us to be great people who are living today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as we get into 1 Kings 18, this is, of course, the famous story of Elijah confronting the prophets of Baal um, there at Mount Carmel. And so I thought it'd be good if we uh, start with a map and a few photos to sort of orientate us as to where we are in the land of Israel. So as you can see from the map up here in the corner, uh, we have the Carmel Mountain Range. And... Um, According to this map, it's about 1,791 feet at its highest point, or if you like meters, just under 600 meters. Um, it's a beautiful mountain range that, that juts up from the plain here, known as the Plain of Jezreel. Has goes by several different names in Scripture, doesn't it? It's also called the Plain of Esdralon, and of course we know it as the Plain of Megiddo because the city of Megiddo sits right here, and uh, we believe that this is probably where the final battle is going to take place. So this is the area of Israel that we're in. Mount Carmel, as you can see, looks out over uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and it's also the dividing point between, um, during this day and time, between Israel. And if you go further up, you're in the territory of Phoenicia. And, of course, this is the area that Ahab had gotten his wife Jezebel from. She was a princess of Phoenicia, uh, and they intermarried, and she comes to Israel, and, of course, she brings with her the worship of her god, Baal. So it's really interesting that Elijah chooses this area of Mount Carmel, which is right on the border of uh, Phoenicia and Israel, as the place to hold this challenge. It's also interesting from Assyrian records uh, that date to roughly around this time period that they refer to Mount Carmel as the promontory of Baal. So think about that. This mountain was famous as being a place where Baal was worshipped. And this is the very place where um, Elijah's going to hold this contest between who's the true God. And so it's almost as if Elijah is giving these false prophets of Baal the home field advantage. They get to be right here at Mount Carmel on the border of Phoenicia, and they get to be in a mountain that is known as a mountain where Baal is worshipped. So it really helps us set the stage for what's going to happen here when we when we recognize those things. Now, here's a picture of the Carmel Mountain Range from the Jezreel Valley, so looking back up at it. Uh, as you can see, it, you have this nice flat plain, and then all of a sudden this mountain range uh, juts up. Um, here's a view on top of Mount Carmel, and there are a lot of different photos to choose from on this. Um, this may not be the best one, but it gives you an idea. Um, it's a very fertile area, very green. And uh, in Elijah's day, uh, it was known for its fertility. And again, this is probably one of the reasons it got connected with the worship of Baal, uh, which was known for uh, Baal being a god of fertility. Okay. Carmel itself comes from the Hebrew word uh, vineyard, and it means like vineyard of God. So uh, even the name itself suggests fertility. 
Um, now, down below at the foot of the mountain is a river known as the Kishon River. This is a, a famous river in a couple of passages in Scripture. In our story tonight, it's the place where Elijah and the people bring the prophets of Baal and they slay them. Uh, it's also famous from the story of Deborah and Barak back in the book of Judges, chapters 4 and 5. And it was the flooding of this river that led to the defeat of the Canaanites under uh, the command of Sisera. Uh, and if, if you remember that story at all, the, the Canaanites had 900 iron chariots coming up against Israel who had zero. Uh, and what chance did it look like that Israel had to win the victory? But the Lord brought a thunderstorm that flooded the river Kishon uh, that caused the chariots to be of no use to the Canaanites, and Israel won a great victory. So at the end of the story tonight, uh, Elijah tells Ahab, get in your chariot and get down the mountain and go to the city of Jezreel because it's going to rain. And when it rains, the Kishon floods and the chariots are useless. So he tells Ahab he better be on his way because rain is coming. Here's a view from the top of Mount Carmel. Uh, looking down at the valley, and you can see a number of famous sites from this area. We we mentioned Jezreel. This is uh, one of the ancient capitals of the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, even though Ahab had moved the capital to Samaria, uh, this seems to be an area that he continued to go to. You know, kings often have several palaces, right? The queen doesn't just live in one place. Here in the UK, does she? She has palaces throughout. Uh, and if you know anything about King Herod in the first century, he had par- palaces throughout the land of uh, Israel. Well, the, the same with King Ahab, several residences, and Tel Jezreel is one of them. And this is the place uh, when the thunderstorm is about to come that Elijah says to Ahab, you need to get in your chariot and get moving and go to Jezreel. And from the top of Mount Carmel, to Jezreel, it's about 17 miles. Okay, so it's a, it's a little bit of a journey, uh, and we're told that Elijah ran uh, in front of the chariot. So, through the spirit of God's hand being upon him, uh, he took a little 17-mile jog himself from the top of Mount Carmel to uh, tell Jezreel. Right. Okay. So, I know that. Uh, Last week, James talked a little bit about the the attraction of Baal worship. Uh, and I just want to mention a few things tonight. Why would Israel be drawn away from the worship of their God to this God? And uh, archaeologists have actually discovered some images of Baal. And we have a lot of Canaanite literature that actually gives us a lot of information about who the Canaanites believed Baal to be and how they worshipped him and so on. Uh, so here's a, here's a stone uh, inscription uh, that shows an image of Baal. Uh, as you may already know, he was the Canaanite storm god. Here he's pictured holding either a hammer or I, it looks to me more like an axe. Uh, and it says here that the Israelites were repeatedly reprimanded for participating in his worship. Um, here is a statue that was uh, discovered in an archaeological excavation. And you'll notice here that Baal has his hand raised, uh, and they believe what might have been in his hand would, was a lightning bolt, because, again, he was the, the god of the thunderstorm. Uh, and pictures of him often show him like with the hammer or the axe and also with a lightning bolt in his hand. Um, this is a quote from some of the Canaanite literature that has been uncovered. And it says, Baal can send his rain in due season. Shout aloud in the clouds. Shoot his lightning bolts to the earth. So think about this. In chapter 17, which you guys studied last week, uh, Elijah said there's going to be no rain in the land until my word, right? So this is a direct challenge to the worship of Baal, who is seen by uh, the Canaanite peoples to be the god of the rain, the god of the thunderstorm. 
So who's really in control? And this drought period is all about teaching Israel that the Lord's the one who's the true God, the one who's in control. Uh, so what was the appeal? Uh, and this comes from a commentary by a guy named Dale Ralph Davis. Um, number one, he says it's royally sanctioned, right? And I think uh, James may have mentioned this one last week, in fact. Um, so because of Ahab's married, marriage to Jezebel, um, that means that you enter into a, a covenant agreement with her father, the king of Phoenicia, uh, and it also then means compromise and bringing in the worship of their gods, which, again, you guys uh, read last week how Ahab built some temples to Baal, right? One, I believe, in, in Samaria itself. So, you know, the people could say, well, you know, it's a legal religion. Uh, it's sanctioned by the king and the queen. Why wouldn't we worship this god? And I think there's a lesson there for us because sometimes things are culturally acceptable. Or sometimes some things are legally okay, but it doesn't mean that we as believers are to sanction those things. Well, the government says it's okay. Well, okay, but we need to check it against God's word, don't we, and make sure that God says it's okay. Uh, Just because the government says it's okay doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. Secondly, there's the appeal of tradition. This isn't the first time in Israel's history that they've had problems with worshiping Baal. If you go back to the book of Judges, this was a huge problem back then. And so the people could say, look, we've been worshiping him for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, So we not only have the sanction of the government, but we have this long history and tradition of worshiping Baal. Third, there could be an appeal to relevance. Again, he's the storm and fertility God. Uh, So the Canaanites teach that he's the one through giving the rain that brings fertility to the crops. And if you uh, want to have a good crop this season, then, you know, you better be in good with Baal. You want your family to starve? You know, you better pay a little attention to him because he's the one that's bringing you the rain and the fertility for your crops. And finally, there there is a sensual appeal. Uh, and to me, this is one of the things that is often the case with false religion is it really does appeal to the flesh. And the worship of Baal appeals to the flesh in several ways. First of all, it appeals to the belly because if he's the rain god who who brings the crops for you to eat, then you want to uh, please him. But secondly, as, as we'll see in this next little section I'm going to put up, um, there was also uh, this idea of going to the temple of Baal and one of the ways in which you would worship him would be to engage in um, sex with a temple prostitute. And through enacting the sexual act, you're enacting an act of fertility. And it's believed that you influence Baal then or Baal to uh, bring fertility upon you, both not only in your crops, but in having a large family. So this sensual appeal would have been huge. Um, some people love the idea of being able to say, hey, I'm very spiritual, and yet indulge in all of their senses, right? And do whatever they want. Um, I think that this is one of the uh, appeals of New Age uh, spirituality. Uh, and I don't know how strong that movement is. It was really big back in the 90s, 80s, 90s, and so on. But, um, you know, you had these people who felt very spiritual, um, and yet they would indulge all of their fleshly desires and senses. And so it it gives this person the illusion that they can you know, do anything they want and yet still be very spiritual. And so the worship of Baal had a similar type of appeal to it. Oops, I didn't know that would all jam together there. It didn't on my screen. But anyway, I'll just read this to you rather quickly. So you'll notice I've been pronouncing this Baal. If you want to pronounce it Baal, that's fine, because Baal is the, the English way of pronouncing it. Baal is the Hebrew way of pronouncing it. And what it means is Lord or Master. 
in Phoenician, and it was a term used in the Old Testament to refer uh, to this Canaanite god. Uh, he bears the titles of Rider of the Clouds, Almighty, and Lord of the Earth. So you can understand how the worship of Baal would conflict greatly with the worship of the Lord, because all of these titles are really the true titles of the Lord, right? Uh, he was the god of the thunderstorm, as we've mentioned, the most vigorous and aggressive of the gods, and he was believed to reside on Mount Zaphon in Phoenicia. Archaeological evidence, uh, there are a lot of different manifestations of Baal. So uh, here we have Baal Hamon. Uh, you've heard Baal Melkart, which is uh, part of the incarnation of Jezebel's worship of Baal. Sometimes the, the extra names attached to Baal have to do with worship in different places or different characteristics of him. So anyway, archaeological evidence of Baal Hamon includes sacrificial pits in his temples where victims, usually firstborn sons, were burned in his honor. This was, in fact, a fairly common practice in most of the Mediterranean area, notably among the Egyptians and the Carthaginians. Now, the Carthaginians are a Phoenician people who left Phoenicia and settled on the northern coast of Africa, and they later became a rival kingdom to Rome. You know the story of Hannibal and the uh, the Punic Wars between Rome and uh, the Carthaginians. Um, and, and they took this worship of Baal with them, and we know from uncovering uh, some of the culture there in North Africa where uh, Carthage was, uh, there's a lot of evidence of, of child sacrifice. And this is frequently noted in the Old Testament. I believe James also talked about that one last week, if I'm not mistaken. He and I had a chat uh, the other night about what he shared And then uh, finally, as we've already talked about, Baal's temples were also associated with holy prostitution. Okay, So hopefully that gives us a little bit of a background on the worship of Baal and why it would appeal to people of this day and age and then what was involved in it. Uh, Have you guys got any thoughts or any questions on anything before we move into the text? Yeah, okay, great. So um, the last thing I want to do before we start reading is I want to talk a little bit about the importance of Elijah and then later his protege, Elisha. Um, this really uh, impressed me as I studied through the book of Kings. So the book of Kings spans nearly 400 years of history, right? Not quite 400 years, but very close from uh, the death of David on down to the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. The ministries of Elijah and Elisha span about 40 of those years. And their story is contained in 1 Kings 17 through 2 Kings chapter 12. Now, if you count that up, that's 18 chapters. Now, Elijah and Elisha don't appear in every single chapter, but almost every one of these chapters. Now, here's my point. Number one, you'll notice that um, these 18 chapters are in the heart of the book of Kings, right smack dab in the middle of the story. And so that sort of draws attention to their importance, the fact that it's right here in the heart of the book. The second thing is is that um, this 40-year period is only one-tenth of the entire history covered by the book of Kings. And yet, 18 chapters are spent on it. So that tells you how significant the ministries of Elijah and Elisha were to the northern kingdom of Israel, that the inspired writer would spend this much time on such a short span of history. Okay, so hopefully that gives us a little bit of perspective as to the significance uh, of the ministry of these two prophets. Right, okay, now we're going to begin getting through the, the chapter. So I'll, I'll put up the verses that we're doing as we go through, and we'll produce a little outline as we go. So in verses 1 and 2, we're introduced here in the story. It says, 
And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab and there was a severe famine in Samaria. Right, so it's been now a total of about three years and there has been a drought in the land. Um, we're not used to too many droughts here in the UK, I don't guess. Last summer was about the closest that I've ever experienced. We actually saw the grass turn brown. And Gloria and I have been here for almost 16 years now. We've never seen brown grass in the UK until last summer. Um, so it's unusual here. And because we live in a modern society where we can go to the grocery store or we can order food on Amazon or whatever we desire, we also don't understand the the severity and significance of what a drought can produce. But in Israel, to not have rain for three years is extremely serious. And remember that in these days and times, most everyone grew their own food. And so if... Um, if your farm fails and you don't have enough produce to feed your family for the year, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to have to try to find it from someone else and become in debt to them. And then, of course, uh, if they're living near you, they're having the same problems. And so the problems just compound themselves. Uh, I remember one year when we were visiting in Israel, we went to the Temple Institute there. And it was a rainy day in Jerusalem. I'm just thinking to myself, oh, why does it have to rain? You know, it's just ruining my beautiful day in Jerusalem. Rain, rain, rain. And I was kind of grumpy about it. (laughs) And we go into the Temple Institute and there was, there was a lady explaining, uh, the various things in there to us. And she says, isn't it just wonderful that it's raining today? And I thought, well, this is a different attitude than the attitude I'm sporting. She said, you know, in Israel, we depend on the rain. There are a few uh, rivers, right? But those rivers are fed by the rain that falls and then the snow that melts from uh, some of the higher mountains. And so uh, Israel is very dependent on its rain. And I learned never to complain about rain in Israel uh, after that. And so this is an extremely serious situation to go three years and have no rain have this drought going on. So we're told that Elijah goes to present himself to Ahab. Where has he been? Where's the last place that Elijah was? He was fed by a raven. Yeah. At the book Karit. And then he moved on to somewhere else because the water was drying up and He went right to the widow and her son in uh, the town of Zarephath, which is in what country? Phoenicia, the very country that Jezebel is from, the heart of Baal worship country. And while he's there, God miraculously continues to feed not only him, but the widow and her son. And then her son... um, comes down with some horrible uh, sickness or something and, and dies, doesn't he? And um, Elijah raises him back to life. And this widow says, now I know that you are a true man of God who speaks the true word of God. And so Elijah experiences a convert to the Lord in the land of Phoenicia. And he comes back to the land of Israel And it's a land of unbelief for many. Certainly their king is not a strong believer. Uh, And certainly the people that Elijah is going to challenge later on are not believers in the true God, at least not strong believers in the true God. So the reason I point that story out is because it's sort of interesting uh, to always compare um, why stories are linked together. You know, as you start to read the next story, bear in mind the story that came before. This is the story of conversion of a pagan who lives in Phoenicia, who's come to know the true God. And now the irony of returning to Israel, this land of unbelief, and therefore it's a land of drought. 
because of its unbelief. The drought symbolizes the dryness of the spirituality of the people. And not only that, but Elijah raising the young uh, woman's, the woman's son back to life also is a, a testimony of the grace of God and how grace, uh, how God can bring life out of death. And now Elijah has been sent back into the land of Israel, which is becoming a land of death due to the drought. And what's he coming with? The promise of sending rain, bringing life back to the land of Israel. Has Israel repented at this point? Have they sought the Lord? Absolutely not. This is a sheer and total act of God's grace coming back to Israel to bring rain that people desperately need who haven't even yet turned their hearts back to him. But that's the kind of God we love and the kind of God we serve, isn't it? Okay, so um, what we're going to see as we move through this story is uh, in, in each scene there are usually two main characters and uh, oftentimes they're polar opposites. In this case, in verses 3 through 6, uh, we have King Ahab and we're introduced to uh, a court official by the name of Obadiah. Obadiah, some Bible commentators think that description of him being over the house of the king means that he exercised a position like prime minister. So think, think of him as being an extremely important and valuable government official uh, uh, within the government of Ahab. And yet there's a huge difference between him and Ahab because he is a faithful believer where Ahab is not. So in verse 3 it says, And Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them, 50 to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land to all the springs of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Uh, so there's a number of interesting points here. First of all, as we're introduced to Obadiah, we're told what kind of individual he is, that he's a man who feared the Lord. And he demonstrated that fear of God by actually protecting prophets of the Lord from the murderous ways of Jezebel. Now, why is Jezebel murdering prophets of the Lord? Well, um, you can read the thoughts of some who say, well, she was a zealous missionary for her God, Baal, and she wanted to wipe out worship to Yahweh. That's probably not 100% accurate because in the ancient world, outside of the land of Israel, people didn't care how many gods you worshipped as long as you worshipped their God too. So it probably wasn't so much that Jezebel was upset that Israelites were worshipping Yahweh. What she was upset about was that the prophets of Yahweh were saying, he's the only one you can worship. Uh, and so they were uh, pitting themselves against her God and her religion. And as a result, then she began to persecute and kill the prophets of the Lord. But Obadiah, who um, is over the house of Ahab, a very important government official, risks his neck, risks his life by protecting a hundred of these prophets and hiding them in caves. And we don't know what caves Obadiah hid these men in, uh, but it is interesting to note that in Mount Carmel there are over 2,000 caves. So whether the prophets were hidden in that area or another area, we can't say for sure, but plenty of caves around uh, to hide these prophets in. And we're told also that he not only hides them, but he supplies them with bread and water. So this means it's not a one-time act where he hides these guys and then he can pretend like 
you know, going about his business and pretend like nothing ever happened. No, he's got to see every day that they get the supplies necessary to continue to sustain themselves. So he is risking his life every day by hiding these prophets and by sustaining them. Now, there's an interesting expression used here in verse 4 of Jezebel. Uh, literally, it says, for so it was that Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord. That's the literal word here, cut off the prophets of the Lord. And then down in verse 5, Ahab and Obadiah, they're out in the land and they're, they're going their separate ways because Ahab is concerned about finding water for the livestock. And he uses the exact same words so that the livestock will not be cut off. It's kind of an interesting contrast here. Certainly in the ancient world, it, it was important during a time of drought, you wouldn't want to lose your animals. You know, they, they're a part of your wealth and a part of your livelihood. But it's an interesting contrast here that while Jezebel is cutting off the prophets of the Lord, and Obadiah has great concern for that, Ahab doesn't seem to share that concern for cutting off the prophets of the Lord. His concern is the cutting off of the animals, his wealth, his power, right? So there's a very interesting contrast going on here. Now, the Hebrew word that's used here is from the Hebrew word karat, which means to cut. And the reason I mention that is the form of it here is karit. Where was it that Elijah was first taken uh, in chapter 17 after he pronounced the drought? It was through the brook karit. Uh, it's how it's pronounced in Hebrew, cherith or whatever in, in English. So it's the, it's the same form of the word. And so this word of cutting off used here of Jezebel and Ahab, it reflects back on when Elijah was at the brook being fed by the ravens. And so we have Obadiah acting like the raven, feeding the prophets of God and providing for them just as God was providing for Elijah to see that he not get cut off by sending the ravens to uh, provide food for him. So this word has a lot of interesting connections, both with the previous story in chapter 17 and then the contrast here uh, in these verses with one another. Now, uh, it says in verse 6, so they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. I've learned not to take an expression like that for granted in Scripture. Now, certainly it's speaking of a literal geographic separation, Ahab going one direction and Obadiah going another. But in the Bible, this idea of a man walking in the way means so much more than just going a certain direction. It's talking about a way of life. The scripture throughout talks about two paths. You know, the way that leads to the Lord and that leads to life and the way that leads to death. And it talks about our walk and how we are to uh, be worthy, you know, walk in a manner worthy of our calling, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. So the, this terminology of walking in the way is loaded. And what we're told here is that Obadiah goes one way and Ahab goes another. And we look back at what we've already learned about Ahab and Obadiah, and we say, yeah, isn't that absolutely the truth? Ahab is going uh, the way of materialism, the way of what's convenient for him, um, where Obadiah is going the way of the Lord in attempting to protect and sustain the prophets of the Lord. So it's no surprise as Obadiah goes on his way in verse 7 because he's walking in the way of the Lord. Lo and behold, guess who he runs into? The prophet of the Lord, Elijah, in verse 7. So in 7 through 15, we have a little bit of a a comparison here between Obadiah and Elijah. Both are servants of the Lord, but both have very different um, occupations, don't they? So, picking up with verse 7, 
Now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face, and he said, Is that you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your master Elijah is here. So he said, How have I sinned that you would that you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you, that the spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place that I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread and water. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here? He will kill me. I get a kick out of uh, Obadiah there. How over and over again, he's like, what have I done wrong? You know, and if I run back and tell my master, he's going to kill me because he's not going to find you. You're going to be gone somewhere else by the time we get back and he's going to kill me. Um, some people um, say that this shows a lack of faith on Obadiah's part and they sort of give him a hard time. Um, but I, I happen to agree with those commentators who who would say that that's not the case. Um First of all, you have to consider his position. Again, he works intimately with Ahab and Jezebel. And uh, he's already risking his neck by uh, taking care of th- these 100 prophets. Uh, and he knows that his master, Ahab, has been after Elijah for three years. And if he raises false hope... Ahab could be so angry that he could say, you know, I've had it, and take his anger out on the guy who said, hey, I found Elijah. Oh, yeah, well, where is he? He's not here, so, you know, I was going to kill him. Now I'll kill you. Um, so it's a very real uh, threat that that Obadiah faces. Um, I do have a quote here that, uh, again, this is from a commentary by a guy named Dale Ralph Davis. It's a really good little commentary. Um, I would recommend it to you all. If anyone's interested, see me after, and I'll give you some of the details on it. He says, um, Obadiah stands in contrast not only to Ahab, but also to Elijah. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about, um, you know, that Elijah seems bold, confrontational, intrusive, while Obadiah appears hesitant, cautious, and fearful. And because of this, some interpreters, in my opinion, misjudge Obadiah. And he goes on to defend Obadiah uh, by saying this, how helpful that Elijah is not Yahweh's only faithful servant. Faithfulness is not so dull that it comes in only one flavor. We don't all have to be Elijah's, in other words, you know. In fact, very few of us probably are Elijah's, right? Thank heaven that God accepts uh, different personalities and different ways of serving him. What he's calling to is faithfulness in our life, to whatever our call is that he's placed in our lives and in our hearts. Moreover, your own pride requires the correction this narrative can give you. Are not uh, You are not called to great works, but to good works, not to flamboyant ministry, but to faithful ministry. Not to be a dashing, but only a devoted servant. Elijah and Obadiah, two faithful and different servants. The service of the real God is so diverse. And so there is a contrast in these verses between the boldness of Elijah uh, and the hesitancy of Obadiah, but we can certainly understand his hesitancy in the situation in which he's in. And after all, didn't Elijah hide himself from Ahab for three years? So I I think really uh, the the contrast that's being made is not that one is better than the other, but as uh, Davis is saying here, is showing that people are faithful to the Lord and they serve in different capacities and in different ways. 
Okay, I'm rambling on. If you got a thought, feel free to raise your hand and let me know. In verses 16 through 19, Elijah and Ahab finally come face to face. So you'll notice in these verses, right, we've got Ahab, Obadiah, Obadiah, Elijah, Elijah, Ahab. So this, the, these scenes constantly uh, reflect two different uh, people and uh, kind of, again, comparisons between them. So uh, in verse 16, so Ab- Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. (laughs) How often is it that through our own rebellion and mistakes, we get ourselves into trouble and then we become angry and upset about the situation we find ourselves in and we strike out at someone else and put the blame on them or we put the blame on God? This is exactly what Ahab's doing. As soon as he sees Elijah, oh, is it you, you troubler of Israel? We wouldn't be in this mess if it weren't for you. Uh, and Elijah's bold and strikes right back. Got nothing to do with me, king. It's all about you and your family. You're the troubler of Israel. You're the one who's brought about this drought through your unfaithfulness. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time here on this word trouble because we have so much more to cover. But uh, this is a key word in many important biblical stories. All the way back in Genesis 34 where Jacob's sons... <clears throat> they destroy the town of Shechem because uh, the prince there had raped one of their sisters. And Jacob says, you brought trouble on me. Um, In the story of of Joshua, in the story of Achan, who steals the Babylonian garments and I think some gold and so on, takes them from Jericho when everything was to be devoted to the Lord. Um, Achan finally uh, is brought to the point of confession and and uh, Joshua and all Israel take him out to stone him. And Joshua's words are, you have troubled Israel. And they name the valley where they stone Achan, the valley of Achor, which is the valley of trouble. When Jephthah makes this foolish vow about his daughter, it's really not about his daughter. He just says, oh, you know, whatever comes out of my house, Lord, if I'm victorious in this battle, I'll offer it up to you. And the first thing that happens when Jephthah comes back victorious from the battle is his daughter comes out singing and dancing because she's excited about the victory. And he realizes, okay, I did a stupid thing. But he puts the blame on her. He says, oh, my daughter, how you've troubled me. <laughs> um Jonathan says the same thing about Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 14 when Saul uh, puts an oath on the people that they're not to eat until he's gained a complete victory over his people. And Jonathan takes a little bit of honey, not knowing that his father had made this oath. And Jonathan says, my father has troubled Israel. So there's all of these stories in the Old Testament that revolve around this significant word. Uh, and so... When it occurs here, um, these these stories, they kind of help form a, a group of defining this word. When Ahab calls um, Elijah the troubler, think of someone like Achan, uh, or, or think of someone like Jephthah who brought trouble on himself through his vow. Um, this is the kind of thing that's behind these words. And... Uh, uh, he's saying, you brought destruction on me. And Elijah's turning around and saying, no, actually, you're the troubler of Israel. Right, so uh, in verses 20 through 40, this will help us pick up a little ground, huh? <laughs> Notice here, uh, there's still a contrast going on. And the contrast is between the Lord, Yahweh, versus Baal. And the question is, who is the true God? 
So let's read. <clears throat> so Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, Not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves. Cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so, uh, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and, and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two sayas of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Ah, uh, well, there's a lot to cover in these verses, but I'm um, going to have to treat it fairly lightly, I guess. Um, the big thing, of course, is the contrast between who is uh, the true God. And Elijah gives the prophets of Baal every advantage. As we said, he meets on Mount Carmel, the borderland between Phoenicia and Israel. He meets on a mountain that's known for the worship of Baal. He gives them the first choice of the sacrifice so that they wouldn't think, well, he's playing tricks of some kind because he chose what he wanted first and he went first. No, no. You choose what you want. You go first. Uh, I'll go last and I'll take, you know, whatever bull is left and so on. So he gives them all of the advantages. Uh, one of the key words running through the text here is the word answered. Uh, and it doesn't always appear in the English text. Like in the New King James that I've read, it doesn't always uh, appear. At the end of verse 21, when Elijah says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, 
follow him. It says, but the people answered him, not a word. First of all, that says so much about the hearts of the people there, doesn't it? They're not willing to commit one way or another. Uh, they're they're uh, spectators. They're sitting on the fence waiting to see uh, what, what will happen. So there's no real conviction or commitment from them. So the people don't answer. Uh, and after Elijah proposes the contest, and says, you know, we'll wait and see which God can bring fire down and he'll be the true God. Then it says the people answered him. That's a good word right there. Okay, so let's just, we'll wait and see. Um, As the prophets of Baal um, call out to him, literally they say, answer Baal, answer us. And And we're told there's no voice. There was only silence. No answer from the false god. And um, finally, uh, Elijah takes over and uh, has all the water, of course, poured on the sacrifice. Again, stacking the odds against himself, isn't he? And against the Lord by wetting the sacrifice, wetting the wood and, and all the surrounding area. Uh, but when Elijah calls out, he says exactly the same thing. He says, answer me, Lord, Answer me. And of course, this is exactly what happens. Without all of the dancing around the altar, without the hours of pleading and begging, without the cutting of himself and letting out blood to try and draw attention from his God, just simple words, answer me, Lord, answer me. Boom. The fire falls from heaven. And the people realize then who the true God is. And they cry out, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I think there's a big lesson here on this idea of um, when difficult times come, who is it that we call out to? And who is it who will answer us? And you know, the scriptures are full of instances where People are in deep trouble and they cry out to the Lord and they're like, Lord, why don't you answer me? You know, why are the heavens hardened? Why, why don't I hear from you? And maybe some of us here tonight have gone through difficult circumstances where we're like, where is the Lord in all of this? I'm crying out to him and I'm not getting an answer, right? I think the story of Job is a great example of this. Um, Job goes through a lot and he doesn't hear from the Lord until the very end. But the point is that if there is silence from the Lord, there's a purpose in the silence. But God will, and God is actually the only one who can answer and provide an answer. Um, we had a good friend uh, write us today about her son who's dealing with some brain cancer. And it's disillusioned him and turned him away from the Lord. He he says he feels alone. And my very thought was, well, who else could you turn to if you don't turn to the Lord in a situation like that? Who else can answer you? You know, what other hope is there? Even if even if you lose your life, um, there's hope with the Lord beyond this life. But there's no one to answer and there's no hope at all if you forsake the Lord. And to me, this is one of the great lessons of this story, that God is a God who answers, and God will answer. Sometimes he stretches our faith. I'm sure people prayed for three years for the drought to end, and there was silence in heaven from the Lord, right? But at the right time, God did respond, and God did answer. Right. Well, uh, wish we could tarry more on those verses, but we'll hasten to the conclusion of the story here in verses 41 to 46. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. 
And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot, and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So here's a great example of the very thing that we talked about. After God demonstrates himself to to everyone that he is the true God, there's still not rain yet. The people are finally convinced who the real God is, where real power lies, but there's still no rain until Elijah goes and prays. But in anticipation of God answering his prayer and sending rain, which God has already promised Elijah he would do, he tells Ahab to go eat and drink. In other words, celebrate. What's one of the last things that you're going to do during a drought? Eat and drink and celebrate, right? But in anticipation of what God's going to do, yeah, go ahead and celebrate, Ahab, because the rain's coming. And Elijah goes up on the mountain, head between his knees, and prays. And here's a great example. Uh, Elijah doesn't just pray once and God sends the rain, does he? He prays, and there's not an answer. He sends his servant up, comes back. There's nothing, Elijah. Second time, prays, sends him up. There's nothing, Elijah. So there doesn't seem to be an answer. Seven times. And of course, it, you know, I don't doubt that it was a literal seven times, but we know the significance of the number seven in scripture, this idea of completeness. And so in other words, at the right time, with Elijah showing the persistence in prayer that we need to show, God did indeed answer the prayer. And the cloud began to rise up out of the sea. And Elijah said, here it comes. Better get down the mountain fast. And so uh, he has Ahab head out. And then we're told this really interesting point about how the uh, hand of the Lord came on Elijah. and He girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Uh, First of all, that's a mighty long way to run, isn't it? Um, But secondly, this idea of running ahead of Ahab, I think, has several significances. In the ancient world, kings, uh, when they rode in their chariots, always had runners going before them to announce their coming. Um, You can read this in various passages in the Old Testament. For instance, Absalom uh, when he's trying to promote himself, gets a chariot in Jerusalem and he gets 50 men to run before him uh, so that you know he can show how great he is. So this is a very common thing in the ancient world for runners to run before the king. Uh, in one sense, this says that, that Elijah is not opposed to Ahab. Uh, Elijah is Ahab's servant trying to draw him back to true worship and to the true God. And so he honors Ahab by being one of his chariot runners and going before him. Secondly, it also suggests, perhaps in a symbolic way, of the way things should be ordered in Israel. Elijah is a prophet, and Ahab is a king. And kings should follow prophets. And when kings follow prophets and the word of God, then the nation is blessed. And so at this point, we we have a moment of hope where Elijah is supporting Ahab. Ahab is following Elijah. Ahab has seen the incredible miracles that have just happened, the fire from heaven, the rain from the sky. And so there's hope for the kingdom that maybe there'll be a turnaround here, uh, even by the king himself. But then sadly, we'll come to chapter 19 next week, right? <laughs> But now we're left with this word of hope. All right, well, thank you all for your kind attention this evening. Let's bow for a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you again uh, as we close your word tonight just for this uh, incredible story uh, and the many, many truths that are in it, Lord. We could obviously spend uh, more evenings exploring it and talking about the richness of the truths that are there. But we thank you, Lord, that 
you are a God who hears and you are a God who answers. And Lord, if we go through times where it doesn't seem like you're answering, may we persevere like Elijah and pray again and again and again. As Jesus said in the parable, just to keep knocking and that you will answer. Um, if you don't answer right away, there's, there's reasons, Lord. There's purposes beyond what perhaps our finite ma- minds can often comprehend. But you do answer at the right time and in the right way. And we thank you that you are a God who is full of grace, that you extend your love to a rebellious people, uh, to a people who sometimes sit on the fence and don't make the full commitment to you that we should. Uh, we're thankful that, that you extend your love even when we are in our sin and that you demonstrate who you are, Lord. Uh, you're a God of amazing grace. And we thank you for that, Lord, because that's what saved us. That's why we can be here tonight. It's all because of your grace uh, and the acceptance of us and the love shown toward us while we were yet your enemies, Lord. You loved us and Christ died for us. We thank you for all these things and we ask that you'll go with us the rest of this week, Lord, and that wherever we go, we will be representatives of you and we will bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.